All right, I'm going to give it a few more minutes just to allow people to arrive. Remember to keep your mics muted and if you want, you can also keep your audio, I mean your video off, up to you. Just want to find somewhere with better lighting. <laughs> I'm moving one more time. This light is irritating me in the kitchen. Perfect. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. If you need anything or if you can't hear me for some odd reason or there's a problem, just put it in the chat. Um, and without further ado, we are going to start our lecture. So today we're going to be doing a little bit of a brief history of neuroanatomy and just some general stuff that we all need to know just to familiarize ourselves with all of these concepts. All right, we are, are we recording? We are now recording. Okay. So let us get started. Let me open up our slides for today. Okay, remember to mute yourselves, even like teeny tiny little sounds I can hear. So yeah. Let's start sharing now. And okay. All right. So today we are doing the history of neuroscience. We're on lecture two and the first part of the beginning of it all as I have very dramatically named it. Okay, I just wanna see if 
Was there a lecture yesterday? Indeed there was. Oh, cool. So firstly, I just want to introduce yourself to introduce you guys to something that's become a bit of a like inside scoop thing at the department. But when Mr. Zondo used to present this course and my statistics and my neuroscience course and all the rest of them, he would always put animals inside our slideshows and we all really enjoyed that. So I decided to do the same. This is my cat Murphy. We call him Detty Pig. Um, if you've ever watched Sex Education, you'll get the reference because he truly is the filthiest animal I've ever encountered. So contents today. We're going to start with the history of neuroscience, specifically looking at neuroanatomy and how that was formed. We're going to look at something called the Broadman areas that were, that were designed by someone that were one of the forefathers of neuroanatomy, if we can call it that. Um, we also are going to then look at the methods of studying neuroanatomy. So obviously there's a couple of ways that we can um, kind of investigate neuroanatomy. Specifically, when we're talking about neuroanatomy, we literally are meaning anatomy. So the brain and all of its ins and outs and stuff like that. So all these gross sciencey things, all these gross medical things, histology, structural and functional imaging, and then MRIs. And then just some basic brain anatomy, just to kind of contextualize ourselves. Right. I want to let me. No. Okay. History of neuroscience. So I've done a timeline. It's not to scale. You can see there because this isn't Maths 1C1. Okay. I did Maths 1C1 in 2018. We both took an L, both me and the course. So I'm not going to spend time now trying to make everything perfect and perfectly to scale for this timeline. I'm just trying to show you what happened first, then what happened, then what happened, then what happened. Okay. We start off with Hippocrates. Um, there's a bunch of different ways you can say his name. I'm just going to say Hippocrates. Okay. And he first came up with the concept of heart versus head. So a distinction between like the self and like, the brain and what was going on there. That was all the way back in fourth century BC. And then kind of the next big thing that happened, if we can call it that, was in 1453 with Andreas Vesalius. And he did on the workings of the human body. Okay, I just want to make this smaller so I can move things around. I'm just going to rather present it like this um, because it's not letting me use my mouse. Um, the next person we had is in 1664, we had someone named Thomas Willis, who very cleverly kind of started to look at the anatomy of the brain. This probably meant he cut up some dead bodies to look at them, um, but we're not here to put Thomas Willis on trial. We're just here to be like, well done, Thomas Willis, and move on. He also came up with this concept of the circle of Willis, which you're going to see on the next slide, which is a collection of um, blood vessels and connections and stuff in the brain. And let's look at them here now. Okay. So this is a brain upside down. So if I had to basically put a camera here and look up into my brain, like from beneath it, Okay, obviously we can see here's our brain. Here is our spinal cord going down. This thing over here is the circle of Willis. Okay, it's made up of the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, the posterior, the posterior cerebral artery, as well as the internal carotid artery. Okay. You can see here, that's what it looks like in practice. You can see brains are not pretty things, um, but heck are they interesting. And you can see here is something called the pons, which we'll talk about later. And here we can see our blood vessels, nice and red and easy to see. Um, there's the optic nerve. You can see that over there. That's where our eyes like send all the signals and stuff. And that's how we can see. 
So it's basically almost right in the middle. So it's quite an important thing. It's something we will look into a little bit later, but just for now, just so we could figure out what Willis is doing. Okay. Oh, someone's asked me to elaborate on the workings of the human body. Okay, so Andreas Vesalius, he kind of was the first person to kind of say, okay, I think these things are connected. Again, um, Mans was fully just cutting up bodies and looking at where all the pipes lead. And that's how he kind of came up with that. Um, so let's move on. So we had Hippocrates, then Vesalius, and then Willis. From there, we have someone named Golgi or Golgi. If you've ever done any brief um, sordid affair with biology, you might know Golgi, as in Golgi bodies. Uh, might be the same guy, might be his cousin. I don't know. But anyway, he did something called a staining technique where basically under a microscope, we could start investigating um, cells that we want to see. He was using silver chromate. This was all the way back in 1873. And you can see there, he managed to find a dye that would specifically show up and highlight a specific thing that we wanted to investigate. So that was quite important because then we could start looking at the cells that are involved in neuroanatomy. From there, we had someone named Santiago, Santiago Ramon Cajal, I think. Not sure. But he basically came up with something called the neuron hypo hypothesis, which is how neurons work. Neurons, I think, is something we do in about lecture eight-ish. I stand to be corrected, though. But if you look at our course outline, you might see the, um, the cells of the nervous system or the cells in neurobiology or just neurons. Anything there about that? That's where this comes in. You might have heard of the thing of a nerve cell, same chat, okay? Yeah, we have our Boyki, um, just trying to move the chat off my screen so I can actually see what's going on. Um, come on, okay, Corbinian Brodman. Brodman is basically the person who came up with Brodman areas, okay? This is all the way back in 1909. And what he basically did was say, okay, look, here's our big ass brain sitting in our head. I think each part of our brain has a certain function. And he basically was able to first label all the parts of the brain and then say what each of those things do. Okay, just to have a look at neurons because we're talking about the neuron hypothesis and staining and seeing all the cells. You can see he has some stained cells. I think they're stained. They might just be a cross section. And this is basically a neuron sitting over here. Okay. Again, here, visualization of neurons, what they look like, how they fit together. And now we're going to move on to Brodman areas. Okay. 52 areas of the brain. You have to learn all of them. I'm joking. You only have to learn a couple. So basically, you can see all these little sections like that, he basically mapped those out and said, okay, this chunk of the brain, it seems like this is what it kind of deals with. This chunk of the brain, this is what it does. Okay. And here are the key ones that we're going to look at. We're going to mostly look at it in terms of like examples and scenarios and stuff like that. So I could say, um, okay, you touch a hot plate and your body is sore or something like that. And you, what's it called, spring away. What part of the brain is involved? And then you might say your primary motor cortex. Specifically, that's more your peripheral nervous system, but it could be something else like, okay, um, you see a picture of something, what is involved? And then it would be your primary visual cortex. Okay, so it's going to be that kind of thing. Or you remember something, that's your memory retrieval, area 10. So let's go through them very, very briefly. It's something we will touch on later. So don't stress about tearing this all down right now. Someone's asked if I can make it bigger. So I'm going to make it a slideshow again. Okay. So areas one, two, and three. 
are the primary somatosensory cortex or the post-central gyrus. We'll learn about all these things later. I'm just kind of showing you generally, this is where we're going. Area four, that's your primary motor cortex. Motor always means move, okay? Think of a motor, think of if you've ever met a child with ADHD, they always say that someone with ADHD, especially like the hyperactive type, they always act like they're on a motor. That's actually the terminology that they use. So I'm not just making up things here. That's how you can remember it. So motor is always to do with moving, okay? That's your pre-central gyrus. So you can see that it's quite, you know, you can see this man really thought it out. We start with the post-central gyrus. Next thing we look at is the pre-central gyrus. And then they're all kind of going from there. Area five is the somatosensory association cortex. Area six, premotor and supplementary motor cortex. Area nine is your dorsolateral or anterior prefrontal cortex. That's involved in motor planning and organization. Um, the example Mr. Zondo always used to use with us was motor planning and organization is like a dance routine. So it's not just you're going to walk. It's like you have coordinated and rehearsed the movements that you are making. Okay. Area 10 is your anterior prefrontal cortex involved in memory retrieval. Area 17 is your primary visual cortex. Area 22 is your primary auditory complex cortex. Area 37 is your occipitotemporal or fusiform gyrus. I know big words. I don't even think they attempted these kinds of words on Grey's Anatomy. Um, bless them. But anyway, and then you can see again, area 22 comes up. Wernix area, that's for language comprehension, and area 39 and 40 are also involved in that. And then areas 30, 44 and 45 are broker's area, which is motor speech programming. And then I put on the side there that area 22, 39, 40, and 44 and 45, they are all involved in language. And you can see how primary auditory, so auditory is hearing, then language comprehension, realizing what someone has said, and then motor speech programming, being able to say it back to someone. Okay, someone said Shepherd could never. Shepherd could never. Like, this is beyond her. But anyway. Key Broadman areas, just to continue, I use this language example to kind of illustrate it a little bit more. 45, 44, 22. Okay, those are the big ones. 44 and 45 are broker's area, okay? They're involved in language production and motor speech programming. So literally our brain figuring out how to speak and then do it, okay? That is broker's area. Wernick's area on the, other, um, on the other end, which is 22 in the Broadman areas, that's your primary auditory cortex and it's involved in language comprehension. So talking, broker's area, comprehending, Wernick's area. You can see there, there's a nice illustration on the side kind of showing the difference between them and how that goes on. You can also see there's a little bit of, um, what's it called, orientation in the brain. Where are we talking about broker's area? You can see it's in the frontal lobe. Okay, so the frontal lobe's right in front here. We'll learn that the more forward you go in the brain, the more advanced evolutionarily it is. So at the back, that's what we call our monkey brain because we share that with all our ancestors and all animals kind of have those basic functions, breathing, um, eating, all of those things for survival. And then as we go more and more forward, it's more and more complex things like abstract thought, um, creativity, um, fine motor skills, all of those things. All right, moving on from that, we're going to now look at methods of studying neuroanatomy. We're just going to highlight three basic things and it's just basically, say we're back in Gray's Anatomy and they go, get me an MRI. Here's the other things that you can do too. All right, firstly, there's something called histology. 
okay? Please do not confuse with history or biology or it being a combination of the two. It's its own thing. Please just give it the respect it wants. You can see they can, like, they're super, super flat things. They almost look like laminated sheets that they're kind of just running through a machine and looking at with light. Let's see how it works. So firstly, histology is the study of body tissue at the microscopic level. So knee things like very, very small stuff. Okay. So we're taking tissue. We're slicing it very, very thinly. So thinly that we can hold it up to air. I mean, to light. Oh my God, air. To light the way we, you know, check like money and stuff like that. And we can see through it enough that we can actually see what we need to see. Okay. We can also use like proper machinery that like shines a beam on it. And then we can see it even better. We can also stain that and then see that better as well. Okay. We're doing this with neural brain tissue, obviously, because we're interested in brain matter and stuff like that. So we'll take some brain tissue from a sample. Um, I can't remember how they do it. I think it might be through your nose. I know that's how the Egyptians removed brains. I'm not sure. It will keep me up to not though. But anyway, they'll take a sample of that brain tissue and then they can slice it, slice it super, super thin and then look at it. Okay, it's almost like a microscopic slide. Um, if anyone's doing any BSc subjects like neuro, I mean, not neuro, um, cell biology, you'll do slide preparing and then you can look under a microscope. Microscopes also will shine light on if it's a light microscope. And then you can really, really see through those cells quite nicely and see what you need to see. Okay, it enables the study of structural features of individual neurons or neurons, which is morphology. So we can actually look at, okay, cool. Are these neurons like looking the way they should? We can also look at how the brain regions are connected to form circuits. So if we splice um, some tissue and slice it super thin and look at it, we can see, oh, there's a little um, pathway or like an interconnected tissue running between those two. That means that part of the brain and that part of the brain must be very, very closely related. So they either have a function in common or they work together to do something else. So that's going to be interesting and important for us to look at. We can also look at pathology and disease. Obviously, if there's pathogens or something in the brain, um, in, well, we suspect it to be in the brain tissue, this is a very easy way for us to check because it's sliced thin enough that you can very easily find something that's not supposed to be there. It's also a way to look for cancer because you can see if there's abnormal cell growth very easily because it's on that thin slice and very, very visible. Okay, as you can see though, it's a little bit tedious because you fully have to take out a little piece of someone's brain. So not the most ideal thing, but when we do use it, flip and useful. Okay. The next thing we're going to look at is structural and functional imaging. Okay, here's some examples, CT scan, PET scan, MRI scan, and DTI tr tractography, tractography, sorry. Those are all just basically different types of structural and functional imaging that we can have. Okay. So instead of stating the whole sentence, we can use morphology. Yes, you can say that histology can be used to study morphology of neurons, specifically say morphology of neurons, because morphology just means like shape or structure. CT scan, PET scan, MRI scan. I know for a fact I heard that on Chicago Med like literally last night when I was watching on Netflix. So if you've ever watched anything vaguely medical, they've definitely mentioned these bad boys. Okay. Firstly, I want us to look at structural imaging. Structural means physically we are looking at the structure. How does it build up? How do the things connect? All of that stuff. So I've written here. The human brain varies in activity and structure from person to person. So in one person, let's say we're using FNIRS, which is a type of like brain scanning thing. It's actually what I'm doing in my research. And so is Mr. Zondor. 
basically a little cap, you put it on your head and then it measures brain activity. Okay, so using structural imaging, we can see what parts of the brain are lighting up more than others. And then we can kind of figure out what's going on. Okay, or what's not working. Maybe something's supposed to light up because we know this from studying it and it's not lighting up. Then maybe there's a problem there. Okay, things do differ from person to person, but generally we can kind of get an idea of the structure and what's going on and why is this different? Is it too different? All of that stuff. Brain structure can be imaged accurately using MRIs or CT scanners. Okay. So they can literally put you in an MRI or CT scanner and it literally takes photographs of your brain, but at each slice, like millimeters apart, not even millimeters, like nanometers apart. And they can basically go through your entire brain without needing to take your brain out because obviously that's not an ideal situation to be in. We kind of do need our brains, unfortunately. So this is a way that they can just do it. They can just lie you on a table, make sure there are no magnets on you because the machine will tear you apart because it is magnetic. They scan you through and then it takes photos of your brain and little slices and then they can look through it. So it's literally like histology, but now it's done all on a computer. We can then compare those images across individuals or groups. So we can compare it to someone else and be like, okay, cool. There's, we can see there's a different th difference there. Should be, we be concerned about that? Or we can look at groups because maybe certain populations will see a certain pattern in thinking, blah, blah, blah. But basically we can see that and then look at like an example of a healthy brain. And we can see, okay, that's got a dark spot on there. That means that there's abnormal cell growth, probably means cancer. Okay, so that's what we mean by comparing those images. Okay, importantly, Gray matter, which are cell bodies, can be distinguished from white matter, which are axons. That means it's possible to correlate gray or white matter volume in particular areas of the brain um, with alterations in specific functions. Yes. Okay, wait. Sorry, I just need to go back into this. All right. I'm going to show you what I mean now. Okay. Okay. Functional imaging now. So we've just done structural. Now we're going into functional. Structural, how does it look? Functional, what's going on? What is its function? What is doing what? Okay. Functional activity in the brain can be assessed using, again, we can use MRR. We can use PETs. We can use EEGs. Electroencephalography. Okay. Whenever we see that CEPH, it means it has to do with your head, okay, brain, that kind of stuff. We've just got two questions before we move on, which is mostly used between MRI and CT scanners. I'm not sure about that one. Um, I think it just varies depending on what is needed for that specific case. So maybe if they suspect cancer, they'll prefer a CT scan. Maybe it's a cost thing. I'm not really sure, unfortunately. Is there a link between structural imaging and histology? Yes, because basically they are doing the same thing. They're both looking at structure. Histology is just the physical cutting up, whereas structural is just um, imaging. So literally just taking photos rather than doing a physical slicing up of the brain tissue. Okay, EEGs. So that's that one there of the long ass word. It measures neuronal activity by measuring changes in electrical activity that is associated with neuronal activity. We'll hear more about this later, but basically when neurons are firing, there's an electrical impulse that is going on in our brain. So we are literally quite electric, okay? So when that neuron passes a message onto another, there's literally electrical activity that occurs and we can measure that using an EEG. That's going to be super, super useful for us because it means that if we want to make sure that like neural pathways are fine or thinking is occurring or whatever we want to do, we can quantifiably measure it like with maths and with numbers, what is happening rather than just being like, I think this person is thinking, you know, like a philosopher, we can be a little bit more 
better about it. But anyway, I have beef with philosophers, but that's my own business. Okay, moving on. PETs and MRIs, the way they work is they measure blood flow in the brain. That's an indirect measure of neuronal activity as well. Because obviously, if there's more blood flow, it means that our brain is working. Okay, why do we know this? Blood needs to carry oxygen to our brain so it can work the same way that um, our muscles work that way. Oxygen has to travel to our muscles to work. Okay, that oxygen goes to our brain. It allows our brains to function and then neural um, pathways can be carried out. Neuronal activity will happen. Impulses will travel. Something will happen in our brain. So in this way, PET and MRR can tell us if neuronal activity is happening and how much by measuring our blood flow. We have a raised question. I mean, a raised hand. Um, do you want to say anything? I think it's Rafil Weir. Rafil Weir, did you want to say anything? Okay. Uh, all right. Well, if anyone does want to say anything or interrupt me, you can unmute yourself and just be like, stop, shut up or whatever and just get my attention. Really don't mind that. Let's go back in. Can I play it in a window? Ooh, that will be useful. Hell yes. All right. Now we're going to look specifically. Let me just put this on. We're going to look specifically at MRIs now. We have a question. So for people with cerebral palsy, oh, sorry, cerebral palsy, do neurologists use structural or functional imaging and why? Okay. So I imagine they would use both because structural is going to tell us if there is any damage to the brain because normally cerebral palsy is a result of structural like problems or like something going wrong with the structure. So it would be useful to keep checking that up. So using that would be helpful still. Functional imaging, yes, that would also be super helpful because a lot of people have misconceptions about people with cerebral palsy not being able to basically, I don't know, think or have cognitive thought or have feelings or opinions. But if you had to perform functional imaging on a, someone with cerebral palsy, you'd very quickly find that they actually do have brain activity. Okay, it's something that they will also look at if someone is in a coma, maybe it might be useful for them to do some functional imaging and structural just to make sure that everything's working, but functional as well, just to see it does this person still have brain activity. Are they likely to wake up, you know, because obviously if your brain dead, you're not going to be able to function. Okay, in our bodies, we have three neurons, right, which are the sensory neuron, the interconnected neuron, and the motor neuron. How do they link with structural and functional imaging? Okay, so all of them together will form a neural pathway, and this is what we, we were looking at in structural and functional imaging, how those pathways are functioning. Okay, there's not like a distinction like, oh, there's a motor neuron or whatever. There might be, but we'll discuss this more these types of neurons at a different stage and see how we can view them. But good question. All right. Now, MRIs. So we saw with both functional and structural, it would be useful for us to do MRIs. So I wanted us to go a little bit more into detail with this. So MRI works by detecting changes in blood oxygenation and flow that occur in response to neural activity. What this means is, like I said, our blood carries oxygen to our brain. The, our brain uses oxygen to carry out functions, and then the blood then takes away the deoxygenated blood to be reoxygenated, blah, blah, blah. Not going to turn this into a bio lesson, but that's basically what's happening. The MRI then works by measuring how much oxygen is going where and how quickly is it going. Like, where's a lot of oxygen going? Is it going quite quickly? Okay, cool. Then that part of the brain must be working right now. Maybe it's going less so in another area. 
then that's yeah an indication that that part of the brain is not being used for this particular function remember we're always using our brain but some parts of the brain as we were learning in Brodmann's areas will be carrying out certain functions and other ones will just kind of be doing background stuff oh sorry if brain area is more active more oxygen is consumed so to meet this increased demand blood flow increases to the active area okay that's what i just said i hope this is all making sense an fmri which is a functional mri can be used to produce maps of changes in blood flow in the brain that are linked to neural activity so when we're specifically doing functional we can create maps basically of where where's the blood going and why. Then we can link that all together and see, okay, well, that's basically probably where the neural pathway is. Since it was going from this part of the brain to that part to that part, that person was probably speaking. Okay, very interesting stuff. I'm doing my research in FNIRS, which is functional near infrared spectroscopy, which is basically what I was saying where it's like, those weird cap things that people put in the, on their heads and then they measure like brain activity. I think we're looking specifically at the frontal lobe and I don't think I've researched quite what specific area yet. And we're going to hook it up to some honor students and basically ask them to look at some statistics and then decide basically where statistics happens in our brain. They've done it for maths before, they haven't done it for statistics which is a completely different concept to mathematics. So this is of interest to us. Now some basic, ugh, basic, basic brain anatomy for us to look through. I just specifically was looking at um, the way that the brain is divide, divided in a lateral sense because there's asymmetry in the brain and there's laterality. We'll talk about what those things mean now. Okay, laterality is seen in the brain. We have a left brain and a left brain and a right brain, okay? It's funny that I made those mix-ups because we'll, I'll explain why now. But basically, even though we have this left and right brain, they aren't perfectly the same size either. I said that there's some anatomical asymmetry the left and right hemispheres have different functions. So firstly, they have different functions. And then secondly, we can see over here, they literally do different things, which is quite cool, okay? Here it's a different shape. He has a slightly different shape on the left side, right side. And we'll see just now over here, we'll chat about the fact that they have different things that they deal with. Called contralateral. Okay, contra always means opposite. Okay, so that's why I laughed when I touched this side of my brain and said this was the left hemisphere, even though this is the right, because the left hemisphere of the brain, so this part of our brain, controls the right side of our body. So literally, my brain was like, touch me, and then touch this side because this hand was being activated by the side. Okay. On the opposite end, then, this right hemisphere of the brain controls our left side movement. Okay, pretty spooky. Okay, also, so besides having that contralateral thing, besides having that division, they also do different things. The left hemisphere tends to focus on producing and understanding language, whereas the right hemisphere tends to um, focus on perceiving and synthesizing nonverbal information. So to put it very, very basic, basically, left, verbal, right, nonverbal. We're going to see now on the next slide how that is not as simple as that though. See, someone has raised their hand if you want to make a point. Remember to unmute yourself when you want to talk. Okay, um, I can't, you don't have a name, it's just a full stop, but your hand is still raised if you would like to say something.
All right, I'm just going to move on then. Feel free to message on the chat or you can send me a private message on this chat as well. Um, at the two function, you can just choose to Sizzware and that's me. Obviously, I look like a Sizzware. Anyway, last thing we're gonna look at, some complications for just being like, okay, cool, left verbal, right nonverbal. We often hear people being like, oh, such a left brain thing of me to do. No such thing, sweetie, okay? It's not as simple as that. You can see that lateralization, left, it's analytical thought, detail-oriented, ordered sequencing, rational thought, verbal, it's more cautious, planning, math, science, logic, right field vision, right side motor skills. And then on the right side, other stuff, okay? It's two complicated things though. Laterality is relative and it is not absolute, okay? Relative means that even though we can say, okay, cool, left side's doing this, right side's doing this, that's not technically true. They're both doing stuff all the time. They both participate and we are in nearly every behavior that's going on. So if you're talking to someone and it's this verbal side, the left side, doesn't mean that your right side is like taking a siesta. They're both doing stuff all the time. It just means that the left side, if we had to put it on an MRI, lights up a teeny bit more. Another complication is that laterality is affected by environmental and genetic factors. So it's not something we can always predict. So someone's left brain might be less focused on the verbal stuff and the right brain is like, no, I'll, I'll take this one. Like I'll get involved too. And we don't see as much laterality. Like it's kind of just all over the place rather than being focused on one side. Um, we have seen that there's cerebral organization in some left-handers. So obviously left-handed is not like the most... Um, ordinary or thing we see every day. Most people are right-handed. So in left-handers, we see some cerebral organization to do with the fact that they are left-handed people. We also see something in biological females. Please correct me if I'm using incorrect language or anything like this, but I'm talking about people that are assigned female at birth. They tend to be less asymmetrical which means that we see both sides kind of lighting up for everything. Whereas men, I think, tend to be, we tend to see that laterality a lot more. So men are more likely to be able, I mean, biological males are more likely to be able to say that they are left-brained or right-brained. But again, can't really tell. Okay, it's quite an arbitrary thing. I had someone ask if I can return to the last slide to take notes. So I'll go over there for a few more seconds. Remember, this will be online. We do need to wrap up those. So I think I'm rather just going to skip to the end just to show you my picture of my cat. Questions. And then I'll go back there. If anyone has any questions, type it in the chat, talk out loud, whatever you want. I'm just going to answer chat question quickly. So it's possible for a person to have both aspects of the left and right hemisphere. Absolutely. We just tend to see, like if I had to take all of you and run some statistics on you, we see that most of the time, we'll see that there'll be specific things carried out on the left side and specific things carried on the, on the right side. But as we just discussed, it's not a steadfast rule. It's something that is happening on both sides in most people all of the time, okay? And just because one side is doing verbal stuff, it doesn't mean that because you're talking, the nonverbal side isn't working too. Okay, Angelique, I see your hand is raised. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know um, regarding the language you were using, it is the correct language, so you don't have to worry too much about it. Okay, thank you, Angelique. I really any appreciate pleasure. that. That goes um, for anything. If you are offended or um, don't agree with something I say, please email me. I don't want to be this horrible autocratic person that's telling you to think the way I think. Obviously, we're learning about brains and you can see brains are very, very odd things. And I'm trying to learn and expand my vocabulary and language and correct understandings of different people's experiences. And I certainly hope that you are all doing the same as psychology students. So just because I'm the lecturer doesn't mean you can't approach me with this kind of thing. 
More questions in the chat. Can someone who injured one side of their brain teach the other side of the brain to do all the work? Certainly, that has to do with brain rehabilitation. If there's a TBI, traumatic brain injury on one side, there can certainly be compensation on the other side. Our brains are flipping cool. Like they can do all of these weird and wonderful things. And unfortunately, it does mean they're a bit complicated to understand, but it is something that we most certainly are looking into and trying to figure out. And it is possible. How do neurologists know if someone had has DID? I'm not sure what you mean by that. If both hemispheres work for normal people. Is DID... Um, an abbreviation for a disorder. It was um, asked in the chat if that person wants to respond again or if someone else knows what DID stands for. Dissociative identity disorder. Oh, okay. So we will talk a little bit about like schizophrenia and stuff like that and how that goes on in the brain. But um, we can map out, as far as I'm aware, if there is DID. It is very, very complicated, though. Even depression is something that's quite tr tricky to look at in a brain and say, oh, that person is depressed. Um, but we'll see, like, we'll see some really cool pictures about these different disorders. So hang tight with that question. I really, really love that. Um, Emma, are we required to understand brain activity or results of any of these MRI brains, e.g.? No, I'm never going to give you a scan and be like, what's going on, bestie? No. Like... What's it called? Just keep this mantra in your head. Um, Dr. Shepherd could never. I'm never going to expect you to understand something that a medical person on a show would understand. It's all concepts and all of that stuff. Okay? One part, one brain as a whole has five parts. Which you see that thing with a lot of nerves. Someone's making a noise. you. One brain as a whole has five parts, which are the cerebrum, cere cerebellum, medulla, oblongata, et cetera. So as these parts of the brain have these different functions like balance and thought processes. So how does the two sides of the brain have different functions? So those things, the cerebrum, cere cerebellum, we'll see, like here's your brain, your cerebrum is there at the back of your brain and has both sides. The medulla oblongata is, I think, in the middle, has both sides, the cerebellum, both sides. Okay, so yeah. So the two sides of the brain aren't having too much effect there. That's also why we're saying laterality isn't just as simple as anything from this side onwards and this side onwards does different things because there's so much interconnectedness. If one side is dead or injured, won't the contralaterality be affected? Yes, that's what we see in strokes. If a stroke happens on your right side, we'll see that thing like where all the muscles relax and stuff like that that's normally like a sign of a stroke on a face you know you see the muscles relaxing and it's because there's a hemorrhage on that side of the brain causing that and then they'll they'll not be able to feel things and all of that stuff can both left and right brains exchange their functions no definitely that's what we're saying it's not a steadfast rule it's just like a general trend that we've seen and it's like a easy way to kind of remember the functions of the brain to kind of delegate them okay um they can exchange functions to an extent um but we don't fully understand laterality of the brain as yet in neuroscience all right i'm going to stay on for a few more minutes i'm sorry that we went over time if anyone wants to ask anything or stay on you're more than welcome to otherwise you can email me um also if it's a general question that you don't mind having the whole class looking at you're welcome to put that on the telegram group i just don't want to be messaged individually on telegram just so that we can keep that lecturer student boundary but yeah thanks everyone here's my cat again i miss him he's in st francis at the moment with my parents so yeah everyone have a good day and let me know if you need anything i hope you're all on the course i think i did add everyone that's really cool. How do I get added to the Telegram? The link is on um, the email that I sent out. Just click it and you can join. Okay, bye everyone. You may leave. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. bye.
Okay, and with that, I'm going to 